Mokra celebrates 25 years. We'll have details next on City Corner. Mokra, and that's the Museum of Contemporary Religious Art, is celebrating 25 years. I'm Steve Potter. Welcome to City Corner. And here to explain more about that, welcome Father Terry Dempsey. Steve, it's good to be with Terry, you Terry, good to see you again. Nice to be here. And uh, your title, would that be director, curator? Uh, director, curator of the Museum of Contemporary Religious uh -huh. Art. We have a small staff, but we have many hats in that small staff. Right. And you probably wear a lot of them yourself. I should, anyway. <laughs> don't often fit, but I do. You and I go back a long way because um, when I started uh, Cityscape, which was a radio program on St. Louis Public Radio, 11, 12, I'm doing the math in my head, about 13 years ago, yes. you had been a regular guest on the program over the years and the exhibit. So anyway, I've been interviewing you on the radio on and off for 13 years. They've been good interviews and I appreciate it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you actually started this museum, or I did. was involved in that. How did that, that happen? It grew out of my dissertation that I did at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. I was exploring the reemergence of sacred content in American art in the 1980s. And uh, when I got back here, uh, the museum is in a building called Fuse Memorial. At St. Louis University. At St. Louis University. It used to be a building for Jesuits studying for the priesthood. At this point, they would be in their uh, formation years studying philosophy. And at one time, it was built in 1954, and there were 250 Jesuits in that building in 1954. In 1989, there were 25 Jesuits, and it's a huge building. Yeah, and you always talk about the, the space. Yes. So the university bought the building from the Jesuits, and it became a lay student residence hall. They didn't know what to do with the uh, chapel. And I put in a proposal when I get, got back here from Berkeley and joined the faculty here. I uh, put in a proposal to turn this into the first interfaith museum of contemporary art in the world. And there were other uh, candidates. The, the fraternities wanted to turn it into a fraternity uh, hall. And uh, I bet my, they had some good ideas. I bet they did. <laughs> my proposal suddenly went to the top of the list. And so, uh, but we've been in business for, uh, we're coming up to 25 years in February. Right. And we're planning the 25th anniversary exhibition a year from now. And, uh, but right now we have a show called Transformations. Right. And the exhibition has, features uh, 31 artists. These are artists all from our collection, and they represent a diverse range of styles and media. And they're all involved in work that takes us beyond the surface reality to something deeper. That's the transformation. They take us to uh, a deeper place, a place that gives us a sense of connection to other people, a place that explores love, suffering, mortality and immortality, and they use all kinds of media. We have the standard media of acrylic paint on canvas or uh, oil paint on canvas, but we also have unusual materials, such as shot puts or blood or shattered glass. But they're making this uh, exploration in, in earnest. In some cases, it's an expression of their own faith. In other cases, it is a, uh, uh, a genuine inquiry into the dimensions of the spiritual and religious. And we're going to look at uh, some of that later. I want to ask you something to sort of clear things up, because for someone that's never, maybe never been there, Museum of Contemporary Religious Art. They might think um, it's sort of like a church service going in. So I want you to just kind of explain how religious is that museum? Well, it's, it's housed in a uh, space that when people come in, they immediately sense that this was a sacred space. There are 12 side chapel galleries uh, that functioned back in the 1950s when it was a uh, place for Jesuits to pray. Uh, each priest had to say his own mass uh, until the Second Vatican Council when the priest could, could celebrate or attend mass. And so you could have masses going on. We've turned those, we've retained most of the altars in those side chapels. They make wonderful intimate spaces. And we have the, the, the big space, which has uh, a huge triptych, but Michael Tracy, which we'll see later on. But people sense that they have a context immediately when they come into the museum. This art is not in a neutral space. It has, it puts people in a framework where they can see it from the spiritual and religious dimension. And the art always has, always has that some sort of religious theme too. Uh, people will be uh, surprised 
by some of the works that we have in there. What is a uh, circular bowl filled with shot puts doing in our museum? It's called the Trinity or Triune. And so this is where the transformation comes. We're taking, in some cases, ordinary materials and asking people to think metaphorically. Ask them to in, uh, go inside themselves and make all kinds of associations. Sometimes the works are explicit, sometimes they're not. But often the ones that are most subtle are the ones that people remember. Mm. Before we get to sharing some of the work uh, at the exhibition, we've got, I think, four shots of the interior of the yeah. museum. And why don't you tell us what yes. we're looking at? This is what the chapel looked like before it became our museum. And they didn't know what to do with it, as I said. Uh, and I suggested we turn it into a museum of contemporary religion. Did that go over right away, the idea? Uh, no. But it was, as I said, when the other proposals were coming in, ours rose to the top. I see. Okay. So it took, a, it took about a year to get that approved. Uh -huh. But the next image will show what we transformed from the same angle. That's the same room? Yes, yeah, the same room. We wow. put up freestanding walls. On the other side of the walls are the side chapels. Next picture. This is looking at the... Uh, go to the next one. Yeah. yeah. This is looking at the, the room from the other end, from the, where the altar was. And we have a gallery up in the balcony also. And you can see some of the side chapel galleries. It looks like too. museum space to me. It's a great space. Yeah. Next picture, I think that may be. And this is one of the uh, a view of the side chapel galleries. And, and it's, it's, how do you use those people to just like step into them? And yeah, they're, they're uh, eight, eight feet square. And uh, there are chairs in each of the galleries. We invite them to spend time there, and they do. Well, you mentioned transformations, and that's the current exhibition, which yes. is up to when? It's up until uh, the end of uh, December. And we have uh, some images of that we're going to we share do. right now. We do. Let's take a look. This is a work by Salma Arastu. Salma is a Muslim artist. She now lives in California. And uh, she does these beautiful works. These, this is about six feet wide. Uh, this is Arabic calligraphy. And she's also. I was almost going to say that's yeah, what it looked like, yeah. That's called Healing Prayer. And it is a prayer taken from the Quran of asking for healing, personal healing, inner healing. Her work is all about con making connections between her own faith tradition and the other great faith traditions. Did you say inner helium? In, uh, inner, inner healing. Okay. Yes, yes, <laughs> that's why I didn't quite understand that. Yes, yeah. Inner healing. All right. Let's go to the next one. This is by a woman named uh, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons. And these are these large format Polaroids. They're about 26 inches in height. And she, it's called Holy Family. When you think of the Holy Family in the uh, Gospels, it would be Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. But this is the Holy Family of Maria Magdalena Campos Pons. She's a, her ancestors are originally from Nigeria. They're brought, they were brought to Cuba as slaves in the 19th century. She now lives in Boston. And uh, she is invoking both a sense of the Catholic tradition and the Aruba tradition in a lot of her work. Uh, these works, uh, each of these people, she is on the left side, she is the mother, her son is in the middle, and her husband is on the right side. They all have eyes on the back of their, on their backs. And the eyes often are the eyes, thought of as the eyes of God for protection. And each one of those eyes represents a year of life. And so a sense of invoking God to watch over them, and also the protection of the parents for the son, too. God's got your back, kind of. That's right, right. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Let's move ahead. This is a very large piece. This is over nine feet in height. It's by a major African-American artist named Frederick Brown. Uh, sadly, Fred passed away in 2012. But he did five paintings for us called the Life of Christ Altarpiece. And this is the large, largest and the most compelling, I think, of all five. It's the Madonna and Child. Fred, while African-American, has many, ans many different uh, ethnicities in his own blood. Uh -huh. And when you look at the face of the Madonna, it looks at first fierce. Uh, but he has dots there. There's a sense of the African mask, or some people have seen an Egyptian borrowing. Some people have seen Australian Aboriginal borrowings. Her eyelids are very close, and uh, they're very highly uh, painted with uh, black, uh, highly gloss uh, paint. And it's as if she knows what's going to happen to her son. Her son is one of the most melancholy Jesuses I've ever seen. He has a sense of what's going to happen to him. It's a powerful work, and it has really uh, been a, one of the most popular works that we have in the museum. Transformations is the exhibition. Let's look at the next one. This is up in our balcony gallery. This is by Thomas Skomsky. He's a Chicago-based artist. He's a practicing Buddhist. And this is called Pieta. Now, when people think of the Pieta, they think of Michelangelo's Pieta of Mary holding her dead son Jesus after the crucifixion. But this is, he calls it the shadow side of the Pieta. And you walk around it, you get covered by those shadows. He arranged the lighting very carefully so that we become part of this work. And all the associations one has with 
of the cage. Uh, some people have seen political prisoners in Latin America. Some people have seen slave ships. Some people have seen the Holocaust. Some people have seen the tiger cages of Vietnam. And uh, there, there's a sheet of steel in there. You can see it's reddish in hue. That on top of the sheet of steel, he has placed dried blood from the Chicago stockyards. And so that sense of suffering, and yet it seems to be rising, as if this cage ultimately will not confine this reality. Now, I'd love, to, I'd love that you explain that to me, but for someone that's there, mm -hmm. do they have to figure this, the backstory out on themselves, or do you help them do that? We have lots of texts on our labels, so we offer commentaries. We don't try to give them everything. We want them certainly to uh, not be left out of right. the conversation. But I think it gets them started. Yeah. And I believe that uh, as an educational institution, we owe it to our visitors to help them. I hate having, walking into a museum and seeing untitled. And what do you do with that? So When I go, though, you'll just walk around with me and explain everything. I will right? explain everything to you. Okay, let's look at the <laughs> next one. This is by Dodo Jinming. She's originally from China. She does these amazing photographs. This is a, uh, there are two photographs in here. What you see at the bottom, people often think they look like women in burqas or nuns or monks fleeing, a huge stormy sky above. What she did, she went to North, she was driving in North Dakota. She now lives here in the United States. And she passed a field that, where these sunflowers were hooded. And those are sunflowers that are hooded. Mm. She took the picture and uh, developed it and printed it as a negative. So the, the image below uh, the sky is a negative. So everything that's dark should be light and everything that's light should be dark. And above, that's another photograph, the stormy sky. So you get this almost apocalyptic feel. Uh -huh. And all of her work has that apocalyptic feel. Let's go to the next one. This is a beautiful work. It's 26 inches wide. It's a small, intimate work. It's by Susan Schwab, who's one of the top uh, silver point artists in the world. Tens of thousands of lines are on this. It's called Sacred Land. And uh, some people have seen uh, the allusion to the land of milk and honey or the column of fire, if you want. If you go, there's a detail of this in the next image. And uh, some of, there's gold in there, but there's also silver. What's amazing about this, you cannot correct silver point. If you put the line down there, there's no white out that you can use. You have to start over. And when you look at how many lines are in there, uh, she is an extraordinarily gifted artist. Uh -huh. Uh, we're just about out of time for this segment, Terry. We have more images, but I'd like to go ahead and skip to the very last one, because the last one, if we can take a look at that, okay. because it relates to what we're going to what we're going to be talking about in sure. the second part of this program. This is by uh, the artist Michael Tracy. Uh, we have a huge triptych by him that is uh, in our space, and it was given to us by him a year ago. And this is a work that we were able to acquire last year, and we are now restoring it. It's an important work. It's called the uh, it's called Cruise to Oscar Romero, uh, martyr of El Salvador. Oscar Romero was the bishop of El Salvador who was gunned down by the death squads while saying mass. Mm. And uh, when we get it put together, you can see it's made up of many pieces. And these pieces have gathered a little bit of uh, grime over the years. Well, you brought along a couple other guests that we're going to talk to. Yes. Uh, what are we going to hear about? They're going to tell you how we're making this look like it did. Uh, they're, uh, it's a painstaking task. I've learned more about restoration and conservation than I ever have, uh -huh. and the unusual materials that are used for that. So uh, they will give a great uh, discussion of that. Oh, great. Terry Dempsey, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Steve. Thank and you. And we love what you do at MOCRA. Thank you very much. And we'll continue with this right after this break. It's the Museum of Contemporary Religious Art at St. Louis University. We'll have more City Corner coming up. Marie, you have prediabetes. Prediabetes? I don't have time to eat, write, or exercise. I'm a busy mom. Oh, you're a busy mom. Yeah. This is great news. Busy moms never get prediabetes. Wait, what? Let me just... Yeah, this is all the people at risk for prediabetes, and way over here, busy moms. Steve 
Potter. Welcome back to City Corner. Today we're talking about the Museum of Contemporary Religious Art in St. Louis, and we continue now. Please welcome Catherine Langdon and David Brinker. That's Let me start with you, David. Um, tell me what your relationship is with the museum and your history with it. Well, I am the assistant director of the museum, but as Terry mentioned earlier, we're a small staff, so that is about six or seven departments at other museums. Uh -huh. uh, but I've been with the museum since 1995, so I've sort of grown up with the museum over what, the years. What's your background? Uh, actually, I was an English major, so there's hope for all English majors out there, um, and uh, music as well. But I also had studied a lot of art history. The museum opened during my undergraduate career at St. Louis University, and uh, I've actually attended every exhibition at the museum. Wow. So. And um, Catherine, you are, you are just working with the museum on this project. I am, yes. I have a private practice in art, uh, art conservation, and I was brought on specifically to work on the cruise that was described in the previous uh -huh. segment. And you're in mid-Illinois somewhere, I forget where. Yes, Urbana. Uh -huh. Why art restoration? Is there a reason you're based in Urbana specifically? Uh, my husband's in graduate school there. But you must work on projects from all over the country, I guess. I work uh, regionally. Um, I work with a lot of institutions in St. Louis, actually. Uh -huh. And um, I also uh, teach a class um, and just uh, generally try to um, do either treatment or um, huh. uh, advocacy for conservation and so help do a lot of driving. Conservation. Lots of driving. Yes. <laughs> David, uh, before we start looking at some of the images from, uh, from what we're going to see here, vis uh, visible conservation, in your own words, what do you think, Father Terry Dempsey was telling, talking a little bit about, about the museum, why do you think it's so special and unique? Hmm. I think it's, it's Terry's vision. Really, I mean, this idea that uh, when uh, folks who study art history, or if you just even go to a, a great art museum like uh, the St. Louis Art Museum, we have all this work of the past. Uh, a lot of it uh, represents biblical scenes or other religious themes. And, and I think for a lot of folks, it feels like that got stuck in the past. Uh, but what Terry saw in his uh, research and now in his curation is that many artists today are still really interested in the religious and spiritual dimensions. They may engage with it and express it and show it in their art in ways very different from the past, uh, but it's still a really vibrant uh, stream, and he's managed to highlight that. Okay, let's talk about the Visible Conservation mm -hmm. Project. Explain it. Well, as Terry was saying, we, last year we acquired this piece by Michael Tracy. Uh, the full name is The Cruise to Bishop Oscar Romero, Martyr of El Salvador. We just call it the Romero Cross because that's such a mouthful. That, yeah. And, and <laughs> that's what we'll do. Um, and uh, as he said, it's a, it's a major work by artist Michael Tracy, uh, who is based in Texas. And uh, so I, I, the, the work, uh, when we acquired it, was in a private residence in Houston. So I went down uh, and met with a team from the artist's studio. We spent about two and a half days disassembling the artwork. What, what, what are the dimensions of it? Oh, I haven't measured it all. I think it stands, when it's on its base and everything, probably about eight feet, uh, mm -hmm. I think, roughly. Um, it, it takes up a whole lot of space. We'll, we'll probably see a picture uh, again at the end. Um, but uh, So I was there to document this, because if we're taking it apart, we also have to put it back together at right. some point. Um, but along the way, we also noticed that uh, the work's 35 years old. And like everything else, art has a little wear and tear to it. Uh, it has fabric and other elements that just deteriorate naturally over time. So I knew that we were going to have to give it some attention before we put it back up. And we decided we were going to do that this fall, and that's when I reached out to Catherine mm -hmm. to guide us through that process. And was this project unique for you in any way, the, the piece that you're working with? It is, um, it's an unusual piece because it is made with a wide variety of materials, um, from wood to human hair uh, to animal horns and um, a, a lot of acrylic paint on the surface. And um, while the treatment itself is fairly straightforward, we're mostly doing cleaning and a little bit of stabilization in order to allow it to look its best when it's being displayed. Um, it had to happen at a rapid pace in order to get it displayed as soon as possible. And um, so we brought in a team and basically just tried to, um, to streamline the process to get this uh, piece with almost 50 components all cleaned and assembled again. It must be meticulous when you're dealing with, you know, when I clean off something at home, I take it outside and I hose it off. <laughs> but with a piece of art, I imagine you're like, you know, scrubbing with a little toothbrush, tiny little bits. Almost. What, what's it like? Um, it is meticulous. Uh, to some people, it might be more tedious than they're willing to do. Um, 
But one thing that you discover in the process is that no material behaves exactly like other materials. So you have to make sure that you're working slowly and carefully and paying attention to what you're doing just to make sure that uh, when you move from one material to another, they're uh, all reacting appropriately. You're not mm -hmm. risking having uh, new problems develop as a result of your cleaning process. So if you, you make one mistake, careful. you could be in big trouble, right? Uh, you could be. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, if you make a mistake, it's going to be small enough that it <laughs> won't matter that much. Uh. Well, when you first saw the Romero Cross, uh, what did you think about its condition and the, the challenge you had ahead of you? Uh, well, I was surprised by the scope of the project, given uh, the proposed timeline for it. Uh, they had originally Am asked I reading me, between the lines they wanted it done quickly? Yeah, a lot of museums uh, work on an exhibition-driven uh, schedule, right. and so when they have time for a project, they usually have a specific display date in mind. And we could not make that happen in this case because it was just such a large scale yeah, David, project. David, you started to say something. Oh, uh, what you're also hearing is that we were a little naive. We have, had never really uh, taken on, had a work that needed this much attention. So we probably had some unrealistic hopes. <laughs> well, you brought along some pictures of, I think, maybe the work in progress. Let's see what you have and you can tell us. So here you're seeing the space, and, and I'll mention, first of all... This is I'm, where it's going to be displayed in the museum. Well, that, that, uh, ultimately it is. If, uh, in the middle, just to the middle of the left, there's a, a gray base there. That's going to be the platform. But uh, before I talk about that, the, the big piece you see on the back wall is another work by the same artist. That's the triptych that Terry mentioned earlier. And that's a work that we've had almost since the museum opened. And so mm -hmm. these two works are going to be in dialogue. So part of what we realized is we are a very small museum. Um, and we don't have the behind-the-scenes space to do a project. No big warehouses. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but uh, we, and we thought, well, but we don't want to shut down the museum for two or three months. We said, well, why not just bring this out into the open? Uh, the public usually never gets to see this sort of work or find out what people like Catherine can do. Just like you're on stage, Kat. It is, although I'm actually I'm supervising the project, and we have three technicians who are doing a lot of the work, and they're the ones who will be in in the public's mm -hmm. view. Uh, but we set up multiple tables to work on all the components. That's what this is. And mm -hmm. uh, for cleaning. So we have padding down on the table, and you can see in the tray on the right side, there are a lot of dirty sponges that we use. I'm trying to imagine what the atmosphere is like. like uh, you don't have music playing, everybody talking, laughing, and you know sharing food, or is everybody just like crunch at a table and it's quiet like a library? Well, we don't want food near the art. No, oh, I, I didn't think of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and, and headphones, earbuds are, are a great help, but uh, <laughs> I, I sometimes wonder what some of them are listening to. Well, I would think if you're doing meticulous cleaning, mm -hmm. you're, you're not talking to the person next to you because you're really concentrating, I would think. You can have conversations, um, but oftentimes people will like to listen to music or podcasts, you know, that right. kind of thing. Hmm, interesting. Let's look at uh, some more images you have here. So now this shows, Catherine mentioned earlier that the sculpture, it's, it's one piece, this Romero cross, but it actually has close to 50 components. Uh, 36 of them are these little, uh, the artist calls them milagros, which is a reference to uh, sort of Latino devotional art, but they're shaped like shrines. They're each little boxes. Uh, those, there's 36 of those that hang off of the main body of it. So I gotta ask you a question. Um, when you're talking about a piece of art that has all these different pieces, did you tell, say how many components there are to it? How many pieces that you had to disassemble? Oh, I mean, we kind of counted up and decided that certain pieces went together, but I think the conclusion was 46. Wow. And I'm wondering when an artist creates a piece like that, they're probably not thinking about who has to clean it in 25 years. Right. Do you ever have no. trouble taking it? Is taking it apart ever a problem? It can be. Um, certainly, uh, artists will construct things um, with the end goal being how it will look as soon as they're finished with it, but not usually. A, um, a look. The better technique is to make sure that it can be transported safely, and um, so that sometimes involves designing it so it can be disassembled properly. Uh -huh. And not everybody takes it into account, um, but you, you hope so. As well, they how did this, you, in your past experience, have this rank on a difficulty scale compared to what you've done before? Uh, this is certainly one of the larger projects that I've um, spearheaded, but it. Um, What's this? Uh, this is. These are a couple of shots of the uh, cleaning process. Um, so in this case, most of the cleaning that was done uh, was cleaning acrylic paint, which can be quite sensitive to liquids. And uh, so the first steps were dry cleaning to remove because the acrylic dusting is water grime. based. It's water. It's a water emulsion, so it. Uh, can be painted out in water, but when it dries, it's not really water-soluble. Um, but it will swell in water, so you want to make sure that you're not 
exposing it to too much water and definitely not any solvents that would uh, affect the, the plastic, mm -hmm. the acrylic resin component. Um, so we did a lot of dry cleaning techniques to try to remove the grime. And so you saw some shots with uh, using uh, graded Do we need erasers. to go back to a couple of those? Or if you'd like to. Uh, yeah, we have um, some shots. You saw a hand rubbing some white powder on the surface that's actually shredded um, er plastic eraser. And that helps to uh, remove grime the same way that it would work. What, what was the sticks here? Uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> the stabilization process, um, one of the pieces had textile wrapped around the base that had gotten very weak over time and had torn in multiple places. And in order to prevent it from tearing more whenever any more uh, movement or contact happened on that piece, um, I, we set down the textile using um, an adhesive so that it would stay just along the edges, so it would stay in place and not pull off. David, I don't know why this occurs to me, but uh, since you're in sort of the management end of it, when you're dealing with a valuable piece like this, I mean, are there insurance issues and things about taking it apart, wonder if she ruins part, is that even a concern? Uh, well, we have every confidence. No, I didn't mean you didn't. <laughs> didn't mean that you didn't. Well, so um, I think you, you have to take that back a couple stages, which is just to that understand that what museums do is we uh, safeguard, we make a commitment to safeguard and preserve objects for future generations, but also for the present day enjoyment of people now. And so mm -hmm. conservation is an important part of that because conservators, as I've learned from Catherine, their first role is, is prevention. First of all, we don't want anything to happen in the first place. Right. But when things do, they have this whole array, and, and Catherine you know, tells me all the different disciplines and sciences she had to study to, to get to this. Um, we then um, want to apply all of that for these works. Now, insurance certainly plays a role in that because, you know, we... I just want to make sure yeah. <laughs> Father Dempsey was constantly looking through the door. We, well, we, we, <laughs> we, we do because that, that's part of our responsibility, but it, the, the main thing is the art, not the, not the we're, we're out of time, unfortunately, sure. but Catherine, is the project done? It is about 60% done. So when do you think it'll be up and ready to go? Uh, we're hoping toward the end of October, beginning of November, we'll know, but we'll definitely announce when we're ready to but reassemble But one of the interesting it. points is this yeah. shouldn't stop people from coming because they can go right. now and watch you and your team work. Exactly. Exactly, and we've got an opportunity for people to ask questions for the conservators if they want to learn more, and we'll pass those along and post those on Facebook. Fascinating. David, Catherine, thank you so much for explaining what's going on at the Museum of Contemporary Religious Arts. It's been a pleasure meeting both of you. Thank you for the opportunity. And I hope you'll check out MOCRA at St. Louis University. I'm Steve Plotter. Thanks for watching this edition of City Corner. Join us next time.